accelerates at a continued rate and it goes unchecked and it'll just rip. And I'm terrified by it. A recent declaration by Neil deGrasse Tyson and Southern California Earthquake Center Director Thomas Jordan sent shivers down the spines of every Californian. The San Andreas Fault appears to be in a critical state and could create a big earthquake shortly. The warning that the southern part of the fault looks like it's locked, loaded, and ready to go is new, but the reiteration of the seismic peril to Californians is not. Skyscrapers will fall, the Hoover Dam will collapse, and a tremendous tsunami will wash across the Golden Gate Bridge, as predicted by Neil deGrasse Tyson. Why are these renowned researchers and other seismologists making these worrisome claims? What exactly is going on with the San Andreas Fault? Let's find out. In the southern part of the San Andreas Fault system, there hasn't actually been a significant release of stresses since 1857. The San Andreas, to put it simply, is one of the numerous fault systems that approximately delineate the boundary between the North American and Pacific tectonic plates. Both plates are moving roughly northward, but because the Pacific plate is moving more quickly than the North American plate, there is a steady buildup of tensions between the two plates. Some of these tensions were tragically released in Northern California during the 6.9 magnitude Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989 and in the San Francisco Bay Area in 1906 during a 7.8 magnitude incident. However, because events of this size have not yet occurred along the San Andreas Fault in the southern part of the state, the 1994 Northridge event was linked to a nearby but separate fault system. It is assumed that one is imminent and that it will be the big one given the amount of stress that may have actually accumulated. How large could this earthquake possibly be? And is it conceivable that it could cause the kind of devastation depicted in the movie San Andreas? The San Andreas Fault causes an earthquake with a magnitude of 9.0 in the movie. Although they do occur occasionally on a global scale, earthquakes of this size are often restricted to areas of the planet where subduction, the forcing of one tectonic plate beneath another, is taking place, such as in Chile and Japan. California has a unique tectonic environment two plates are moving past one another in this instance. So, according to recent predictions, the maximum earthquake magnitude along the San Andreas Fault System is limited to 8.0, though it is estimated that there is a 7% chance that such an event will occur in Southern California within the next 30 years. In contrast, there is a 75% chance that an event of magnitude 7.0 will occur during that time. The energy that such events would unleash varies greatly, with a magnitude 9.0 event releasing 32 times more energy than an event with a magnitude of 8.0 and 1,000 times more energy than an event with a magnitude of 7.0. However, the damage is unavoidable, whether the earthquake is a 7.0 or an 8.0, but the entire chain of events as portrayed in the movie is improbable. For instance, the San Andreas Fault is not located beneath the ocean, therefore any movement along it would not be able to significantly move the water to the point where a tsunami would be produced. As the plates are sliding relative to one another and not away from one another, the opening up of a vast gap is likewise from the realm of fantasy. Realistically speaking, however, a lot of destruction is probably going to happen. There is no way to make a building 100% secure despite California's strict building rules, which urge the retrofitting of seismic protective systems to older buildings and forbid the construction of new buildings close to recognized fault lines. The U.S. is attempting to comprehend the repercussions of a significant southern San Andreas earthquake. In order to simulate the strains that have accumulated in the region since the last significant event, the Geological Survey modeled a 7.8 magnitude event with a slide of 2.7 meters. This model revealed that the structures crossing the fault will sustain the most severe damage. Fortunately, as a result of the 1972 Alquist Priolo Earthquake Fault Zoning Act, such buildings are rare. However, the 966 roads, 90 fiber optic cables, 39 gas pipes, and 141 power lines that span the fault zone would be impacted by this slippage. Building damage cost an estimated $33 billion in total. While contemporary structures fared well, older structures were more vulnerable. As gas mains and main water pipes are destroyed, fires will blaze. 
as they did after the Northridge earthquake. In fact, the damage from the subsequent fires is anticipated to be more expensive than the damage from the original shaking. 1,800 people are thought to have died in all, and just when it seems like things can't get much worse, the main event will have so severely disrupted the region's tectonics that a string of possibly strong aftershocks will start. For instance, after a 6.2 magnitude earthquake devastated Christchurch, New Zealand in 2011, the area around the city suffered more than 10,000 aftershocks. Thankfully, the movie San Andreas is entirely fictitious and contains the usual amount of hyperbole from Southern California-based filmmakers. However, this does not absolve California of responsibility. The big one is coming, and it will cause a lot of havoc, despite the fact that the movie may have more fictional elements than truth. California is locked and loaded. The strains have really built up, and when they start to come out, they might come out for years. The Pacific Plate, which is moving northwest, and the North American Plate, which is advancing past it to the southeast, are the two main tectonic plates that share California's surface. The two plates don't only touch at one point, and there are other seismic faults dotted around the state. The San Andreas is the most concerning because it causes earthquakes that are extremely deadly for people living in California. It has been far longer since the southern San Andreas Fault ruptured than it has been since the northern San Andreas raised San Francisco in 1906. Based on past earthquake data and investigations into earthquake faults, Southern California has experienced significant earthquakes on average every 110 to 140 years. A magnitude 7.9 earthquake that rocked Fort Tijon in 1857 was the most recent significant quake to occur in the Los Angeles area. The fault hasn't broken for more than 300 years farther south, close to Palm Springs. Neil deGrasse Tyson claims that eventually, the defect will have to manifest itself. While seismologists are unable to predict with certainty when that will occur, they do publish a prognosis for the possibility of such an event every few years. According to the most recent prediction, there is a 7% probability that California will have an earthquake of magnitude 8 during the next 30 years. According to Tyson, magnitude 8.3 earthquakes are the largest that can occur in California and might occur if the entire San Andreas Fault ruptured from the Mexican border up to Northern California. The shakeout scenario was developed several years ago by a team of earthquake scientists in order to determine what would actually occur when the big one eventually strikes. Seismologists predict how the Earth would tremble, and other experts, such as engineers and social scientists, then use that knowledge to predict the harm and repercussions that would occur. The in-depth report investigates the repercussions of a fictitious 7.8 earthquake that occurred in the Coachella Valley at 10 a.m. around the 13th of November 2008. Within minutes, earthquake waves rip through California, destroying older structures, obstructing highways, and severing water, phone, and electricity connections. But the earthquake is just the start. Because of the clogged highways and broken water supply, emergency services are unable to put out all of the flames that ignite. Whole areas of Los Angeles are destroyed when smaller fires combine to become larger ones. The San Andreas Fault is traversed by the lines that supply water, power and gas to Los Angeles. Following the earthquake, these lines break and won't be repaired for months. Many modern buildings are rendered structurally unusable even though the majority of them survived the earthquake. Days later, the state is shaken by aftershocks, which intensify the devastation. According to USGS seismologist Lucy Jones, one of ShakeOut scientists, the scenario is actually rather overstated. Jones claims that the scale of the earthquake's fire damage astonished the report's crew, but it might have been worse if the Santa Ana winds were blowing at the time. These seasonal winds increase the risk of wildfires by blowing dusty, dry air from the interior toward the shore. Although Los Angeles maintains a water supply on its side of the San Andreas, the reservoirs have been depleted by the present drought. If the earthquake happened today, water reserves wouldn't last as long as they would when full. The researchers calculated that such an earthquake would result in $200 billion in total damage, 50,000 injuries and 2,000 fatalities. However, it's less about people perishing in the earthquake. According to Neil deGrasse, it is about people's misery in the wake of the earthquake and their abandonment of Southern California. Everything a city needs to function would be devastated, possibly taking longer than a year to fix, 
including the water, electricity, sewage systems, telecommunications, and roadways. Without a working infrastructure, Los Angeles' economy might quickly collapse and its population would disperse. Neil deGrasse Tyson asks us to imagine America without Los Angeles. Tyson believes that the imaginary San Andreas disaster's improbable scenario may make people believe they have nothing to worry about or can do nothing about it, even though it might serve as another wake-up call for Californians. Even if earthquake prediction is now impossible, moviegoers may believe that scientists will be able to give them a good warning of the big one. However, Californians can get ready for the future. Working with the LA Mayor's Office for the majority of 2014, Tyson's scientific team found vulnerabilities and improved city readiness. According to the task force's study, building standards might be modified to call for the modification of older buildings so they can survive significant shaking. It might be possible to strengthen the Los Angeles aqueduct so that it won't collapse if the San Andreas fault ruptures. To guarantee that people could communicate, power, telecommunications, and internet systems might be improved or equipped with backup solutions. The idea would increase the city's capacity to withstand a catastrophic earthquake, but it would cost billions of dollars, take decades to implement, and face other challenges. Individual homeowners can make improvements to their homes to make them more quake-resistant. Extinguishers can be included by individuals in their earthquake kits to put out little fires before they grow out of control. Everyone should approach each day as though it could be the big one, since today or any other day could be that day. However, California isn't the only state that faces a significant risk of earthquakes. Even more hazardous than the well-known San Andreas Fault are a number of lesser-known fault zones that are present throughout the nation. Because of the longer intervals between severe jolts than in California, some of these faults have the potential to produce earthquakes larger than the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, but many residents who live nearby are unaware of their presence. To the north of the San Andreas Fault, where the ocean crust is being thrust beneath the North American continent, is a considerably greater threat, at least in terms of sheer magnitude. This 680-mile-long region of colliding landmasses, known as the Cascadia Subduction Zone, is 50 miles off the coasts of Oregon, Washington, and southern British Columbia. It is capable of producing earthquakes of a magnitude of nine, which are 30 times more violent than the worst the San Andreas can produce. There could be many more earthquakes before this one, but they won't be as large. This area, which encompasses Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver, would be utterly destroyed by an earthquake of this size. The number of casualties and destruction from an earthquake in this country might be in the thousands. Major thoroughfares won't be passable. Structures that would have survived a lesser amount of shaking could be damaged or destroyed if the shaking lasts for the entire four minutes. In addition to the risk from shaking, a tsunami would probably inundate the low-lying coastal areas in a matter of minutes. The Sumatra earthquake and tsunami of 2004 were triggered by the same kind of fault as Cascadia. Thankfully, these large earthquakes only occur once every few hundred years or so. Unfortunately, another significant one could be coming soon for the problem. In 1700, a huge earthquake of about magnitude 9 ruptured the whole length of the Cascadia Fault. The result was a tsunami that damaged some of the Japanese shorelines and spread throughout the whole Pacific Ocean. The average interval between these large earthquakes, according to scientists, is about 530 years, However, the latest study on maritime landslides brought the average down to 270 years by revealing numerous magnitude 8 earthquakes on the southern portion of the fault in the intervening years. These earthquakes were produced by earthquakes that occurred during the past 12,000 years. The probability is substantially higher because there have been 308 days since the last one. In fact, according to recent landslide research, there is a 75% chance that an earthquake of magnitude 8 or higher will occur in the next 50 years. And to make matters worse, the area is unprepared. Tyson claims that Portland has a large number of unreinforced masonry structures that are susceptible to collapsing after a powerful earthquake. Retrofitting has only just started. It will be a complete mess. At tectonic plate borders, where land masses are colliding or pushing past one another, the majority of the world's significant earthquakes take place. But a geological mystery in the center of the nation, close to New Madrid, Missouri, has produced some of the biggest earthquakes ever recorded for the United States, but is still a mystery to geologists. 
Near New Madrid, a series of at least three enormous earthquakes occurred in 1811 and 1812. The largest of them, with a magnitude of over eight, generated violent, destructive shaking in a region 10 times greater than the 1906 earthquake. Nearly two-thirds of the country, or two million square miles, were affected by the quake. The Mississippi River saw boats washed out by enormous waves as the ground rose and dropped. Trees were bent, wide fissures appeared in the ground, and large landslides raced down hills, riverbanks, islands, and sandbars gave way. Tyson and others calculate that there are 500 years on average between earthquakes by looking at sand deposits that were ejected from the soil during previous large quakes. But because it is impossible to predict earthquakes, and because it is unclear why large quakes happen away from plate boundaries, it is even more challenging to calculate the likelihood of the New Madrid earthquake. The probability of a significant earthquake between magnitude 7.5 and 8 occurring in the next 50 years is 7 to 10 percent, according to the best estimate from the USGS. Although the New Madrid region has a much lower chance of experiencing a significant earthquake on any one day than the Bay Area in California does, the potential for devastation, if a quake does occur, is higher due to the extent of the area that could be forcefully shaken. The absence of awareness and readiness in the area is another contributing factor. Living in the San Francisco or Los Angeles regions makes it practically difficult to ignore the earthquake risk. Every few months or weeks, minor earthquakes serve as a reminder to locals. But earthquakes aren't at the top of most people's concerns in New Madrid because the War of 1812 happened so long ago. In addition, the majority of the local structures are not retrofitted. The same forces that created Utah's breathtaking beauty are also responsible for a very dangerous seismic risk that might be fatal. The 240-mile Wasatch Fault, which runs along the base of the western side of the Rocky Mountains, runs beneath Salt Lake City and the Metropolitan Corridor of the state, which is home to 1.6 million people. Geologists have discovered evidence that the Wasatch Fault is capable of releasing shockwaves as large as magnitude 7.5. Despite the fact that no significant earthquakes have occurred there since the Mormon immigrants arrived in 1847, it is one of the longest normal faults in the world, meaning that when an earthquake occurs, the land on one side of the fault sinks in relation to the other side. In prehistoric periods, a single earthquake caused the fault to slip up to 10 feet. The Wasatch Range was essentially created by that process, according to geologist Chris DeRoss of the Utah Geological Survey. The fault has shifted nearly seven miles in the past 17 million years, lifting the mountains above the valley level in the nearby area. Each part of the fault acts separately and has its own history of earthquakes. We are basically due for an earthquake. We're really entering the area where we'd expect to see one right now. Forget about tsunamis and widening chasms. Instead, prepare for strong shaking, building damage, fires, and significant economic effects since these regions are likely to be in the spotlight for a considerable amount of time. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.